Okay, so the plan is to move on to the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So, thank you for that uh, sub. I appreciate that very much. What is going on? Oh, that, okay. All right, so uh, here's the disclaimer. This information that you're about to hear is coming from my memory. And uh, we'll go through a lot of the results. Um, for the most part, my stuff is accurate. There may be some small technical details that I miss uh, simply because it's going from my memory and I'm getting older and my memory is fading. Uh, nevertheless, Sloan Digital Sky Survey um, is what we'll be talking about today. It was a survey that was done in the early 2000s. So it was kind of designed and built in the late 90s um, and then launched in the early 2000s. The goal of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey was to get the redshifts of a million galaxies. And it turns out that they ended up doing uh, two million. Initially, it was a million galaxies and basically a million stars in the in the in our own galaxy. But it was a sky survey. I pulled this up right here, so we can take a look at the telescope and show a little bit of details about the telescope itself and then what they used it for. Um, so if we go to Apache Point of Point, like this observatory. So Apache Point. Observatory is located in New Mexico, and they built this Sloan Digital Sky Survey at the Apache Point Observatory. Um, there are a few other telescopes at the at APO. Um, there's like a three and a half meter one. So the where I went to graduate school, they had um, stuff going on at the three and a half meter telescope. So you can see kind of what observatories look like. You have telescopes kind of spread out around around the top of the mountain with a bunch of roads that lead up to them. Um, and you know where they find a good land, wow, there's like a post office there. Um, they'll, they'll set them something up. So solar observatory, Kitt Peak has a solar observatory. Um, if we zoom out a little bit, we can see uh, where this is located relative to everywhere else in New Mexico. So it is quite a ways down to the south. So there's White Sands, um, which is famous for um, where the nuclear testing took place. And here's El Paso. So it's north of El Paso, Las Cruces. That's where New Mexico State is located. Um, anyway, so the Apache Point Observatory down here. Now, you, you, of course, you put the observatory up in the mountains because then you get um, less atmosphere. Uh, it's a dry area, so there's less water in the atmosphere, so you get um, better conditions to observe. Now, on the in the Apache Point Observatory, there is the Sloan Digital Sky Survey Telescope. Uh, it was a SDSS telescope. Uh, it was like two and a half meters, something like that. We'll go to Wikipedia, the source of all human knowledge, um, to get some of the details of the telescope. And then we'll actually go through looking at some of the results. Uh, uh, where's the image of the telescope? It does not show an image of the telescope, which is not what I expected. So we'll just go straight to images. This is what the telescope looked like. Okay, so this is, oh, that's actually a more interesting image. So it's basically this telescope out on the end of a, of a, I don't know, some kind of porch looking thing. And then you have other telescopes in the area. Uh, so that's the Sloan Digital Sky Survey Telescope. It's got this box around it. It's got this uh, set of leaves that would open up the telescope every night. Um, it was just over two meters in diameter, so it's not a particularly big telescope. Uh, what it had was a large field of view. So the footprint of the camera was fairly big so that they could um, take images of large chunks of the sky at once. If we look at the camera itself, SDSS camera, uh, it has a series of CCD chips. So this is what the camera looks like. Okay, so you have a series of CCD chips. You'll notice that all of these CCD chips have different colors, slightly different colors, and that's gonna be important in a minute. So that's the footprint of the camera. So each one of these things, uh, and what they would do is they would take an image of the sky and then they would shift it slightly and then take another image and then shift it slightly and take another image and shift it slightly and take another image. And they would do that with 
Um, well, there were two aspects of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. One was the imaging survey. The other one was a spectroscopic survey, and we'll get to that in a minute. So the imaging survey, they would go up, take an image of the sky, shift the camera, take another image, shift the camera, take another image, uh, so that these this row of chips would form a line, and then you would cover it the same part of the sky with the next row of chips, and then with the next row of chips, and then the next row of chips, and the next row of chips. So the colors that you see here are because they have different filters. Uh, so the there were five different pass bands, um, and this is what they look like. Um, okay, so this is gonna be low resolution, but it's okay, we'll work with it. So they had five different pass bands. So you have the visible spectrum, or like the spectrum of electromagnetic spectrum, light coming from a variety of different places. And what you typically want to do with astronomical measurements in order to get a, good un a better understanding of what you're looking at, you know, what kinds of stars you're looking at, what their properties might be, is you want to compare the brightness of the stars in different wavelengths. Uh, now, one way to do that would be to take the star, li the light from that star, and spread it apart in a spectrum, in a like a prism or a spectrograph, and measure its brightness in all wavelengths, like spanning the whole electromagnetic spectrum, at least the part that you care about. Um, the problem with that is that uh, that means that you have to have a fiber uh, pointed at every individual target, which is a lot of work. On the other hand, if you just take an image, um, then anything that you can resolve in your camera, you could get some kind of crude spectrum from, provided that you observe the same thing, like take multiple images with different um, in different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. So this shows the the five different filters that they put over to these different CCDs. So they have a CCD chip and they, each one has a filter on it of, in these five different colors. So there's UGRIZ um, and it became like a standard. Now it's a fairly standard um, filter set that you can get. Um, optics companies will produce these kinds of filters. So they basically just define some kind of chemical composition for the filter. And then what they did is they measured how much does, the, does this filter transmit in each of the different wavelength ranges. And so you can see here, uh, even though this is green, this is U, so U for ultraviolet, uh, G, so that's the green one, R, uh, which is the red, basically is this one, I is goes into the near infrared, so because red basically ends around 7,000 angstroms for those that still use uh, angstroms anymore. Um, so visible light basically ends kind of at this dip that you see in the red filter, or except that this is the eye filter. And then Z is the kind of, it's also near infrared, but it's further near infrared. So U, G, R, I, Z, and pay no attention to the fact that the colors here don't match what they represent. U is supposed to be ultraviolet because visible light is basically from 4,000 angstroms to not quite 8,000 angstroms. Um, it's usually like 7,000 is kind of where the cutoff is. So green is right here in the middle. Uh, green is at five, 500 nanometers or 5,000 angstroms, it's green. And so that's why this is the green filter, even though it's listed here as blue. Anyways, U, G, R, I, Z. And this way, you know how much light is transmitted through the filter. So when you take an image of the sky where you're passing all the light through this filter, um, while it does remove, what, 90% uh, of the light that comes through, at that wavelength, it only allows light from that wavelength to come through. So when you're taking an image with the, the U filter, it removes all of the light that's at longer wavelengths, and you're left with just the light that is in this passband of about 1,000 angstroms, or like 100 nanometers. Okay, and then you observe it again, you shift the camera, and now you observe that same part of the sky in the green, which is a wider passband, but it's here, um, where while it, in, it only allows through 40% um, of the light that comes at that uh, wavelength range. It eliminates all the stuff around it. So you're basically getting a, a crude spectrum, different colors. Um, and the reason that you would do something like this is, for example, if you take a look at, um, let me pull up the drawing pad. If Say you have a star of a given temperature. So let me do a couple different stars and what the spectrum of those stars might look like. Um, so SDSS, a lot of it was focused on galaxies, but you know you, you can kind of do the same, play the same game with galaxies. I got to sneeze. Okay, success. Ah, thank you for that raid. I appreciate that math raid coming in. So we have a, let's say you have a hot star. A hot star will have a spectrum that looks kind of like this. And you have a cool star, and a cool star will have a spectrum that looks kind of like this. 
Okay, so now what happens is, let's say that you observe in this passband here and in this passband here. Okay, so these are the two bands that where you're going to observe is this area and this area. So this could be, for example, between the green and the red filters um, on the from the SDSS. Okay, so when you look at the at this bright star, it will be brighter because now you know what the filter transmits, and so you can divide by the filter and as a consequence get the actual amount of light that you receive. So for this bright star or the hot star, um, it will appear brighter in this filter and dimmer in this filter. So if you subtract the brightness that you get in this filter from the brightness that you get in this filter, uh, so let's let's call this filter A and filter B because then I don't have to keep track of them. Um, so if you subtract A minus B, A minus B, then the hot star will be, this will be a positive number. Um, in, in terms of like the brightness that you get through filter A and the brightness that you get through filter B, this difference will be a positive number. On the other hand, for this dimmer star, the one that's down here, um, you have filter B right here, and it's, it's actually brighter in filter B than it is in filter A. So if you did A minus B here, then this would be a negative number for the, for the dimmer star or the cooler star. Um, and so that's why when you have, even if you have just a crude um, ability to resolve things with these different filters that are on there, you can still actually get a fair amount of information about the kinds of objects that you're looking at. Yeah, so this is intensity in the vertical direction here, and it is wavelength in the horizontal direction here uh, for this image. Uh, so y equals intensity, um, x equals wavelength, and the area under the curve or the, the different curves show you the uh, would be the spectrum that you get or the the spectrum that you would get from different uh, temperature stars. Hotter stars tend to be uh, shorter wavelengths, emit shorter wavelength light and have and are brighter than colder stars. Okay, so that's the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. That's why the telescope camera looks the way that it does. So here's uh, another image that shows the layout of the of the CCD chips. Okay, and so because they had this footprint, they would just march across the sky taking samples um, or taking images, and they did it for a long time. Uh, they, the footprint of the observations f is actually the logo of the, at least the original Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So if we look at the SDSS logo, um, it has, okay, it's changed, but the original logo. This is a different one. Uh, the original logo was not on here. Uh, cap. That's not it either. Okay, so the original logo is apparently no longer visible. Um, let me try one more. Let's see, STSS observation footprint. Maybe I'll just have to draw it so that everyone can be amazed at my amazing drawing skills. So the original, um, oh yeah, here's an example of something being observed. So like here's the spectrum you get from a star and here's what the Sloan, what the SDSS, SDSS passbands look like. And here that colors actually line up with what, you, what you're what you observing um, with the UGRIZ. So that is what it looked like. Now the original, um, yeah, used for ultraviolet. Uh, so the original logo of SDSS was something like this. It had an oval that was kind of shaped like that, and it had a cap. It looked like a parachute. It looked like a parachute came up coming out this way, and then it had another thing that looked like that. So this was the original SDSS logo. And what it showed was um, this was an area that they surveyed uh, you know, in a particular direction, and then this was stripe 82. This is Stripe 82, and Stripe 82 was a region of the sky where they went back over and over and over again and observed it many, 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 many times uh, so that they could get a really deep, um, meaning they could see dimmer and dimmer things by adding up all the images um, in Stripe 82. And so, uh, but there, for some reason they don't, so that was the original SDSS logo. Let me see if it can do like SDSS2 uh, logo. They've, anyway, so they changed it. Um, 
at some point in the past. Now, they've gone through several iterations. Uh, is it? Uh, is this a Zooniverse tel telescope? Yes, this is the telescope where they've done um, a lot of the stuff from Zooniverse came from SDSS. SDSS really changed a lot of how science is done, uh, especially in astronomy. Um, so in, in SDSS, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, so it started in the early 2000s um, with this uh, big campaign to observe a big part chart of the sky and then also to do a spectroscopic survey, which I'll show you in a little bit. Um, and you can see here that they've gone through like SDSS, uh, here's the original one, uh, SDSS-3, SDSS-4. I don't know what their current iteration is now, but they, they're still using um, they're still using the telescope and they're still continuing the survey because it's a useful instrument, right? It hasn't, um, it's not defunct or outdated. And they've been updating some of the instrumentation that's on it. The telescope itself, like the mirror lasts forever. So, um, or it's easy to resurface if you need to. So they've continued it on beyond uh, SDSS, SDSS-2, which was completing the survey. They didn't quite finish the survey in the time that they needed because, you know, weather happens, all sorts of things happen. Um, and uh, when they started out, it was basically a bunch of people saying, we need to do, um, we need to survey all these things. There's a variety of science we can do from it, but they needed to get the funding together to do it. And one of the things that was interesting is that if you look at the people who fund the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, does it show it on here? I'm not sure if it shows it on here. We're going to go through these results in a little bit. Um, yeah, it's funded by the Department of Energy. So there was funding from the Department of Energy, I think, and the Sloan Foundation. So that's where the Sloan Digital Sky Survey comes from. So the Department of Energy uh, got on board with this. And in particular, Fermilab got on board with this. So this was early um, in, so the director at Fermilab, Fermilab is a particle accelerator. So you may be wondering why did a particle accelerator laboratory get involved in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey? And the way that they got involved in it, because there have been a bunch of cosmologists at Fermilab for quite a while, since the early 1980s, there were um, people doing cosmology and studying you know, the universe as a whole at Fermilab. Um, like Rocky Cobb and Michael Turner. And um, so there, there were a number of people who from the 80s and 90s had been doing cosmology who were associated both with the University of Chicago and with Fermilab. And what they, the way that Fermilab got involved was through computing. Because in order to analyze all these images that are coming off of the camera, you need to have a large computer. And that's one thing that Fermilab has is a large computer. Because when you have um, these particle colliders where you have beams of particles and like millions of things uh, coming out, you have to process that information. And so the computing resources that you need to, that you have to have in order to do um, high energy physics experiments using a collider, um, you have to have a lot of computing power. And so computing power is also what you need in order to analyze a lot of uh, data from a tel telescope survey. So they did, um, Fermilab got involved. Uh, John Pe John Peoples, I want to say. John Peoples. Um, Fermilab. John Peoples. So he was the lab director at the time. Um, looks like he's... So he was at Fermilab when I was there. He was still, he still had his office when I was there. Um, got to eat lunch with him quite a bit. And he was the lab director and he's like, this is a good idea, I'm gonna put some money towards it. And so he kind of you know, pulled the strings that he had at his disposal at Fermilab, and put in about a million dollars or something like that to um, go into the Sloan Digital Sky Survey to help get it off the ground with the commitment that they would also be involved in um, doing the analysis of the images at the end. So he was, uh, he was, people's managed to shut down of the SSC. So um, that's like his, one of his main claims to fame is that he turned off the superconducting super collider, uh, wound it down. Um, and he served as chairman of this thing for here and was director, this is the important thing, director of SDSS from June 1998 to June 2003 at the beginning of the survey. Um, he stepped down as a position at uh, from his position at Fermilab director in June 1999. Um, but he was still, he came in, he was always in his office, um, even after he had stepped down, even after he was on SDSS. So I didn't arrive at Fermilab till 2006. And uh, it was still going on, and he was still there all the time. Uh, he absorbed, yeah, he absorbed the energy himself. 
So this is this is one of the important things about getting SDSS off the ground was um, he was kind of instrumental coming in with some millions of dollars uh, at a time when they really needed it in order to get the, the thing launching. So the imaging survey was one part of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. The other part of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey is the spectroscopic survey. Uh, and here's how that worked out. Okay, so the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, we've seen the, what the camera looks like, but we also have these devices. Um, I have a couple of these, but they're actually not in my office right now. Um, I was trying to find them and was unsuccessful at doing so. Um, they're downstairs in the machine shop. So these are Sloan Digital Sky Survey plug plates. Uh, if you look very closely at them, um, can I? Can you see? Yes, you can see them. If you look really closely at these plug plates, they have holes in them. And so what they would do is they have this plate. This plate fits over um, the aperture where the camera would be located. So you know the light comes into the telescope, bounces around a couple times, and then goes through some aperture that. Uh, illuminates the camera, you bolt this across the surface of there um, so that the light uh, from the telescope goes instead into these holes. Um, and in particular, after you do the imaging survey, you process the image and you say, okay, here are a bunch of objects that we want to look at. So you've done the imaging survey, you have five color information about all the different objects that you see in the sky, and then you can identify, oh, this looks like a star, you know, it has the behavior of a star in UGRIZ, this one looks like a galaxy, this looks like a, you know, something else. So you, you assemble an imaged catalog of what the sky looks like. Then you go back, um, probably like a year later, uh, and you put together these plug plates. So what's shown here, you choose the targets that you want to look uh, you want to observe from the imaging survey and you say, okay, these are the galaxies we want to look at, these are the stars we want to look at, and then you drill a hole, you drill that pattern in the sky. So these are basically constellations, even though they're a lot dim none of these targets you can really see from the naked eye. Um, these are all faint targets. Uh, but these are basically, you know, star maps. And they drill holes in them that are the size where you can plug fiber optic cables into it. So that's what the plug plates look like on one side. The other side of the plug plates um, look like this. So this is the back side of the plug plate. Uh, there are 640 holes in, well, 640 locations that are drilled into each of these things. So holes, not in counting the ones that where you bolt it onto the, onto the disc or like onto the telescope. So 640 holes and they're divided up into probably groups of 10, something like that. And then you have an undergraduate student come in with a bundle of fiber optic cables <clears throat> and plug them in to the holes. <coughs> so you have a bundle, it's got 10. Uh, each one of these is marked off as, you know, regarding like where, where you're supposed to plug it. This one goes here, this one goes here. And so they would plug it in by hand, uh, filling in all of these different um, things with fiber optic cables. And then you just run a test on it, right? You illuminate it with something um, and you, or you like flicker a bunch of lights on it and then you see, like make sure that the holes are lined up properly. So you don't just like trust the undergraduate that they plugged it into the right spot. Um, you plug it in and then you test it to make sure that everything's plugged in correctly and if they miss something then they can switch it around. Um, if you look at the plug plate with the wires coming out of it, <clears throat> here's what it looks like on the back with the wires coming out. So these things plugged into the plate. Um, here's another one that shows like here's the bundles of wires that you would plug in. Here is the undergraduate student uh, who's plugging the wires in. Um, and here's another illuminated plate so you can kind of see what the what these patterns look like. So you plug them in and then you, it, it, it does look kind of random because they're basically just locations of objects, stars or galaxies in the sky. So then you go back over what you've already imaged and you take the light, you know, you take another image except now you're shining the light through a fiber optic cable and into a spectrograph and then you're splitting light into a spectrum. Now it's not a super high resolution spectrum, um, but it is a spectrum where instead of seeing gigantic passbands like what we saw, um, instead of seeing five different colors, you'll be able to resolve something that looks like, you know, like a spectrum that has like features in it. So it'd look like this across wavelengths. Instead of having brightness in five different passes, you can actually resolve things at about like the, I think the resolving power was a few thousand. Um, so it's about the 0.1%. You get resolution, spatial, 
you get energy resolution at about the 0.1% level, maybe a little bit smaller uh, from the spectrograph that they had. So that is what these plug plates look like. So it was the Sloan Digital Sky Survey was both an imaging survey and a spectroscopic survey. Uh, and the spectroscopic survey was important because you want to be able to map out both the positions of galaxies in the sky and the redshift to those galaxies, how much the universe has expanded when you go to these different galaxies. By mapping out the redshifts of the different galaxies, um, you'll be able to identify you know, structures in the universe. Uh, and so we'll take a look at some of that stuff here. Another thing they did, so they did a, a million galaxy redshifts was kind of the design uh, that they had. And this was to add on to or to improve upon the previous surveys that had been done in the early 90s. Um, there was one that was done by Harvard, Hawaii, um, I can't remember the acronym, but there was a, a previous survey that had, you know, had done a few hundred uh, galaxies or maybe a thousand galaxies, something like that. Um, this is a million, so this is uh, quite a bit bigger in terms of what it would be able to do. Uh, the, so that was the imaging survey and, and the spectroscopic survey to, in order to get the redshifts to do the cosmology. When you do the spectrum of the different stars, um, so the reason you would take the spectrum of the stars is because then you can get information about their chemical compositions and stuff like that that also plays an important role in understanding um, how stars are moving, uh, what the stars are made out of, different populations of stars and things like that. And so we'll take a look now, go through some of the results that we had from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. But that's the basic idea. You had a telescope. Um, that looks like this. Uh, it has both an imager and it has this capabilities of doing spectroscopy. Um, the subsequent instruments have changed uh, what they've done in terms of like how they operate things. Um, so I think now the current spectrograph probably takes more than 640 objects, but at the time, you know, this was, this is what they did. This is the first time this was done, like big digital uh, survey, because CCDs were only a decade old, right? Digital cameras really didn't come into being until the mid 2000s. Um, you know, maybe a little early 2000s, but getting stuff on your phone where you can get, you know, six megapixel images on your telephone, that's a fairly recent discovery. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the science results that they had. And we'll, we'll start with the cosmology stuff because it really was initially a cosmology survey. Um, like, what does the structure of the universe look like? So uh, we're going to steal all of this stuff from the SDSS science page. This is the website where the, um, the results are housed using measurements of more than 1 million galaxies for the first time in the distribution of quasars. Uh, so we'll see all the all these different things. This image here is, this is a big deal image. This is like one of the most famous images in all of cosmology. Uh, this is the Sloan Digital Sky Survey uh, galaxy map, basically. Every dot that you see on this image, um, every dot that we've seen on, that you see on this image is a galaxy. And the redshift of the galaxy is measured. So the redshift is how much the light has stretched out. And that stretching is primarily, not entirely, but primarily from the expansion of the universe. So the universe expands, um, light coming from one galaxy gets stretched out, and then you measure that by this quantity z. The amount that it's been stretched is one plus z. And so you take these amount of stretching, subtract one from it, that gives you the redshift. Um, and each of these dots is a galaxy. And so what you see from this image is that there are structures that form. It looks like kind of a foam where you have like big blobs of things and then you have some gaps where there isn't a whole lot of stuff. And then you have this, this is the Sloan Great Wall, uh, which for a long time, I think it's been superseded now by something else, but this was like the Sloan Great Wall, which is the largest cosmological structure that had been observed to, to that point. Um, it's, you know, it's gigantic. This is many, many, many millions of parsecs across. Um, a structure of galaxy clusters that ha are all associated with each other because they lie on this filament. So you have these filaments that connect um, these overdense regions where you have clumps of galaxies, you know, hundreds or thousands are, of galaxies clumped together, and then these filaments connecting them and voids in between them. So you have, you know, only a few galaxies in here and lots and lots and lots of galaxies in these other regions. So this up here, uh, this top one, that's, I believe, going to be the cap. So the it's like a cone-shaped uh, survey footprint that's been projected into, you know, into the two-dimensional image. This one down here, the southern part, that's the stripe 82. That's the part where they imaged it over and over and over again. Um, but it's a single stripe, and so it's uh, more diffuse in terms of uh, what they uh, what they were able to see out at these large, large-ish redshifts, right? So this is redshifts out to 0.15. 
um, which is what the last. So looking back in time, because the farther away you go, the farther back in time you're looking. So this is looking back in time to um, what redshift point one five. Um, it's probably something on the order of five billion years, um, maybe a little bit more into the past. Uh, I used to know that conversion, but I can't remember it anymore. Um, but there are calculators that you can look at online to see like what redshift point one. I guess maybe we should do that real quick. Uh, redshift, redshift to time conversion. Cosmological calculator. There's a cosmological calculator at, uh, let's try this one. So we want a redshift of 0.15. Go. In a flat universe. And a redshift at 0.15 is, so it's like two and a half billion years ago. The age at that redshift is uh, not quite 12 billion years, and this is not quite 14 billion. So it's two billion years ago. So that, this, image is looking back essentially two billion years um, and and moving forward uh, which H oh that's oh this these H's here these are the hours um, so zero H is basically like looking at the prime meridian and then you go in hours around the kind of around the sky um, so there should be 24 hours around the sky each each hour is 15 degrees um, is what that H stands for Okay, so this is the Sloan Great Wall, the, the structure of the galaxies that you see in the universe. And one of the reasons that you would do something like this is so that when you're looking way back in the day, you can look at the clustering properties of galaxies. You can say two billion years ago, galaxies clustered in this fashion, and you can like map out where the galaxy is located, do the statistics of their clustering properties, and then move it forward in time and say, oh, this is how galaxies cluster today. And so here's how the universe has evolved over the last, or like the clustering properties of the universe have evolved over the last two billion years. Um, the light traveled, uh, yeah, so the light that they are seeing at this redshift, and they, they went further, they went deeper in redshift, but this is the image that they chose. You know, they have to make a cut somewhere. And because the problem is that when you go to further redshifts, you're only seeing the brightest objects. So there's, a, there's an issue that comes in when you're making these kinds of observations that when you're looking nearby, you can basically see everything. But when you're looking at greater and greater distances, you're only seeing the bright objects. And so it biases your sample. Um, it's like, in this case, it's, that would be a, what do they call it? It's called a magnitude limited survey, which is like limited by the brightness of things you can see, which means that you can see very bright objects at large distances and dim objects only at close distances. So you don't get a complete sample. You don't get what the alternative is a volume limited survey. A volume limited survey means that you observe everything in a given volume. Um, a magnitude limited survey is you observe everything to a given brightness, but that means that you're that your distances in that survey extend are, are different depending upon the brightness, the intrinsic brightness of the objects that you're looking at. So uh, that's probably why they're, you know, they chose a cutoff for some scientific reason, and, and that's where that came from. Uh, another thing that you'll notice in this image, um, and this came up in some of the early conferences, or like one of the early conferences, is the, these kind of vertical, or like these radial structures here. So it, the, the shapes where these clusters form um, they're oblong, right? They're kind of elliptical. So if I draw a picture of this to kind of exa exacerbate it, we have the Sloan Great Wall that looks, you know, a bunch of stuff strung along here, and all of these blobs are look like this. So here's the Sloan Great Wall, but you'll notice that they're all elliptical, pointed inwards, like this. Okay, so here's these things, the blobs are pointed inwards. You can see these lines are pointed inwards. Uh, here, there's another blob that's pointed inward. This blob is pointed inward. So that they're not spread out in the other direction. They're all pointed inwards. And there's a an early conference where the person said, I don't remember, I wasn't part of the discussion, so I only heard this uh, through the grapevine, is that someone at the thing was saying, see all those ellipses? Those are the fingers of God pointing at you. And I don't remember if it was like telling you that you're wrong or something like that, but they were they're called fingers of God. Uh, these things, because they're all pointed at us, they're all pointed at the Earth. Those come because what gives you the distance to all these things is the stretching or shrinking of the spectrum. These are all consequences of the fact that these galaxies are orbiting around each other. So you have a cluster of galaxies. Those galaxies are all going to be in orbit around each other, which means that some of them are going to be moving towards you and some of them are going to be moving away from you. And as a consequence, the average redshift 
for a cluster of galaxies is going to be you know in the middle of that blob but because some of the galaxies their peculiar motions so not their cosmological drift motion but their random motion from their regular motion from their you know orbits around each other some of them are going to be moving towards you and that's going to blue shift the spectrum and it will shift that galaxy even though it would be here because of the cosmological drift um, the Doppler shift measurement that you make actually makes it so that it looks like they have a smaller redshift. And then in the opposite direction, if it's moving away from you, then it'll stretch the light out even further. And, um, and so they, these uh, measurements, because Z is a measure of the cosmolo or Z is a measure of the redshift or the stretched out uh, nature of the spectrum that you observe, um, when you have these random motions, it stretches them all out along the line of sight. It doesn't stretch them in the in the opposite direction because you're not measuring the motion across the sky you're only measuring the motion along the line of sight and so all of the all of the distortion that you get these redshift space distortions um, come from you know this is an example of a redshift space distortion uh, come from these peculiar motions of the galaxies so those are the fingers of god in this sdss galaxy map so this was a really big discovery from sloan digital sky survey pretty early on all right, let's take a look at some of the other ones they had. Uh, the distribution of quasars. So this is um, quasars, distant galaxies, uh, quasi-stellar objects. Let's see if I can get this image to come up. It does not appear to want to come up, so maybe here. No, that's not what I want to do. Oh, go, just go view image. Okay, this is the 40,000 40, quasars observed from the SLOS SDSS Data Release 3. So Data Release 3 um, was in the middle of its first survey. You know, every year um, they would release their data. And this was actually also a new thing that Sloan Digital Sky Survey, uh, Sloan Digital Sky Survey did all sorts of new things, even in terms of like the organization. So they had a, a program where it was basically people who were builder, builders on the instrument. Uh, they got a certain place in the authorship and they could claim ownership of certain things. Sloan Digital Sky Survey, they would keep their data proprietary for one year. So the science team members of SDSS, the data were proprietary for one year. They could do whatever science they wanted. And then there were big catalogs that were released um, after every year. Here's the next year's observations. Here's the next year observation. Here's the next year observations. That was totally different than what had ever been done before. What had been done before, you know, sometimes they didn't release the data. They just released the results. Um, this was like a public catalog. It gave you all sorts of tools to do analysis by yourself. And as a consequence, it was really influential because not only could you get all the publications from the members of the science team themselves, but then the science community could add on to it, um, make their own you know, contributions both to the database, like post-processing, you know, we're going to analyze the results using this other filter and get you know, this other software that gets, um, you know, pulls out different information. And so um, the structure of the science team, the openness with which they publish their catalogs, you're releasing them every year, um, it became, you know, it's one of the most highly cited surveys ever in the history of astronomy because they released their data and uh, they organized their team this way. And this actually had a big effect on later missions. So in particular, the Kepler mission. So I was on the Kepler mission and once we brought on, like I joined with the participating scientists kind of after the mission had already been built and was about ready to launch. They brought on new members of the science team, and a number of us were kind of young scientists who grew up, came of age at the time of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And so we remade, we collectively, the, all of the members of the science team, reorganized the science team on the Kepler mission and modeled it to a large extent after what they did at the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Our data release policies, um, they already had some data release policies that were similar to that. The organization of authors, the way that the working groups functioned, um, the way that information was passed around within the collaboration, a lot of it was modeled on the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Um, and that in, so that informed the Kepler mission, which in turn has informed the operations of the test mission. Um, so it, the, this survey actually had a big impact across science, um, you know, more than maybe even the people on Sloan appreciate. Okay, so what you're looking at here, these are the quasar results, 46,000. This is 46,000 spectrum. Um, so you take a spectra of these distant quasars. You can identify quasars because they have certain spectral features. You uh, and you can you stack forty them up based upon where these spectral lines line lie up. So this is the wavelength range from four thousand angstroms to nine thousand angstroms, um, and then this is redshift, uh, which we've already seen. But now we're going out to 
uh, you know, redshift of five. The map that we saw earlier only went to redshift of 0.15, which is down here. So all of those, um, that galaxy structure map only goes out to basically this line across here at 0.15. So this goes way, way deeper in redshift. Uh, redshift five is like really early universe, like a few billion years after the Big Bang, um, instead of a few billion years ago. So this is like 10 billion years into the past uh, for you know redshift five type objects. So this is getting back to the really early uh, formation of ob of galaxies and stuff like that, quasars. Quasars is basically the adolescence of a galaxy. Um, so they take a spectrum, and you can see these different lines. So the H alpha line, that's a, a line from the first, uh, the second excited state to the first excited state in hydrogen. Uh, you have these magnesium lines and iron lines and triply ionized oxygen here, uh, calcium, uh, calcium four. Here's lime and alpha. Uh, the Lyman alpha forest is over here, so that's um, the absorption of the Lyman alpha line into in intervening dust. Um, anyway, so all of these different spectral lines show up here, and then they're sorted. These quasars are sorted in order of redshift, and then they stack them up like this. And so you can see um, basically how the universe has evolved with time by looking at how these redshifts have changed, um, like where these spectral lines line up. So. It, it's a pretty amazing image that shows these um, basically the evolution of the history of the universe for the last 10 billion years, uh, measured from the quasars that you that they saw in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And this is data release three, right? There was I don't know what data release they're on now, like 14 or something like that. So that is the the quasar results. It also shows uh, the galaxies. So they have a bunch of galaxy images, uh, including this one. Um, you can see in this image, like all these galaxies in the distance, right? So here's a galaxy here, here's a galaxy there, there's a galaxy, all these, most of these blobs are actually galaxies. Uh, so there's a galaxy, there's relatively few stars in most of this uh, material, um, but these blobs in the distance are galaxies. So, you know, here's one right there, all of these things, you can see them in the background. So Sloan Digital Sky Survey did a galaxy survey, and so the Galaxy Zoo, that's the citizen science thing, where it's like, is this a spiral galaxy, is it a barred spiral galaxy, what kind of, you know, how do you classify it? Um, that's another thing that was particularly interesting with um, SDSS. The map of nearby galaxies, this is not something I've seen before. Let's see what it looks like. I mean, maybe I have seen it. Um, so in later iterations, after they did the original survey, this SDSS-1 and SDSS-2, they turned the telescope back over to the scientists and said, okay, now what do you want to work on? And so they started making up new surveys that they could do with the telescope and you know, maybe some new instrumentation. And so in this one, mapping nearby galaxies at APO, um, they, have, they had one that was a search for exoplanets. Uh, they had one that was a, looking at um, this one, Apogee, is looking at the chemical composition of stars. So let's take a look at this Apogee. So Apogee is APO something, 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 something. Uh, and it's designed to look at the chemical composition of stars across the, uh, the galaxy. So this is a rendition of the Milky Way galaxy, basically what we think of the structure of the Milky Way galaxy. And we can map out the structure of the Milky Way uh, relatively well. And so they're pointing the telescope in these different directions and identifying stars along those lines of sight. And then they take the spectrum of those stars, not to look at the redshift because they're all in our own galaxy, but instead to look at the chemical composition and look at the variation in the chemical composition of the different stars. Uh, because you know you have stars that form in the center of the galaxy that are gonna have certain chemical properties because they tend to be older stars. And then you have um, stars that are closer to us, they're gonna have different chemical properties because they're second and third generation stars. And so by mapping out um, all these stars in the galaxy can give an idea of the chemical history of the, of the galaxy um, as well as, you know, some indication of what we might find in exoplanets. So if we see one of these planets, uh, if we see planets going around one of these stars and we have good chemical composition for those stars, um, then you know, that might tell us what the planets are made out of or, you know, what we might expect for planets to be made out of in these different areas. So this uh, Apogee Apache Point Observatory Galaxy Evolution Experiment. Um, so the Galaxy Evolution Experiment is looking at the chemical evolution of the uh, of the galaxies. Let's see. Uh, do we know where the center of the universe is? There's no center of the universe, right? It's it all happened at once. Um, so we don't we don't have a everything kind of happened all at once when the universe 
was formed. So there's no real center to it. All right, so other things that it did. So when it did its observations of the Milky Way galaxy, it was able to get a number of spectra of stars, uh, mapping out uh, new objects. So it was able to discover, Sloan Digital Sky Survey was able to discover all sorts of things. Um, small, uh, not very luminous globular clusters. It was able to identify small galaxies that were orbiting around the Milky Way galaxy. So initially there were only, well, for a long time there were only two known satellite galaxies to the Milky Way galaxy, uh, the large and the small Magellanic Cloud. And then over time people started discovering other satellite galaxies around, going around the Milky Way galaxy. Um, and with Sloan Digital Sky Survey, because they have this map of a big chunk of the sky, they were able to find more and more and more uh, less bright, you know, dimmer accumulations of stars and identify some of these satellite galaxies. So Sloan Digital Sky Survey identified probably what, two dozen or something like that satellite galaxies around the Milky Way galaxy. Um, did a lot of work on, here it shows that they did a lot of work on brown dwarfs. Uh, this one in particular is a really famous image. This is called the Field of Streams. So the Field of Streams here. What this is looking at is um, you can, with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, you can identify stars that are moving together uh, because you're getting the position in the sky and you're also getting their radial motion. So you basically just look at uh, how fast they're moving along the line of sight. And when you have a bunch of stars that have the same kind of radial motion, it indicates that they probably formed from the same environment. And so this field of streams, you can see that there's one big stream that comes across here. There's a second stream that's right here. Like a, it looks kind of like a bright band that runs right there. You see this bright band, there's actually kind of two of them. And I thought there's another one that's down here that I think yeah, it's easier to pick out with a computer. Um, so this is the field of streams. What these streams are, these lines are, are stars that are from a satellite galaxy orbiting the Milky Way galaxy where that satellite galaxy has been stripped apart. So a satellite galaxy will come towards the Milky Way galaxy and the tidal forces, the fact that the near side is attracted more strongly than the far side to the Milky Way, will start to elongate that galaxy. Um, so you have a satellite galaxy, it comes towards the Milky Way, it starts to elongate, and then what happens is the ones that are closer to you orbit faster. So as it comes in closer, it starts to orbit faster, which starts to stretch it out um, and produce a stream, a tidal stream of stars that are stripped off of that satellite galaxy. And the stars that are orbiting more rapidly give you an idea of the future motion of the, of the whole stream because they're just, they've been moved a little bit, but then they start orbiting faster. And so it shows where the galaxy is eventually going to go. Um, and then the stars that go behind give you an idea of where it used to be. And so as you look at these tidal streams from galaxies basically being ripped apart by the Milky Way galaxy, you can map out the structure of the galactic potential, like the galactic gravitational potential, and you can see where these galaxies are going, where they came from, and you can see them stretching out and you know, map out basically the orbit. And so these, uh, the Sagittarius stream loops all the way around the whole Milky Way galaxy. This, this is the Ophiuchus stream, I think is this one, and then there's the Monoceros stream that are all um, satellite galaxies that have been ripped apart by the Milky Way galaxy. And these are the different, again, you can see the different stripes of the observations that they made in, the, um, in that image. So another really famous thing. As far as exoplanets are concerned, SDSS has not really been a major player because it's not what it's designed for, but it does give a lot of information about um, the chemical composition of the different stars. And so from the chemical composition of the stars, you can infer the chemical composition of the planets that might form. And then of course, these are Kepler planets because everything that's cool in exoplanet science came from Kepler. So here it's like Apogee, you know, combining these things um, to produce, you know, some information about exoplanets. So those are some of the original results from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey in terms of um, like images, stellar properties, you know, understanding what's going on with the Milky Way galaxy, uh, and then this um, SDS map up here. Some of the stuff that's not listed here um, or that's not shown in these results that I'm going to go over now are like the SDSS uh, supernova survey. So they use the Sloan Digital Sky Survey to identify type 1a supernova that contributes to our understanding of dark energy. Now this wasn't the thing that um, let's see this is probably not what I wanted to look at because it's not going to show the images. 
so this was used to refine our understanding of dark energy. So they did a supernova survey similar to the ones that actually discovered the um, dark energy itself, did the same kind of survey except now with um, using Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So each of these images is a galaxy. Each of the bright spots that you see in these galaxies is a supernova, a type 1a supernova that you can use as a standard candle to infer the properties of dark energy. You can use them to measure basically how did the universe expand as a, as a function of time because you, you know the intrinsic brightness of type 1a supernova. And so you can identify what's called the luminosity distance, how far, like basically as the light spreads out, how, how bright that object, what the distance of that object will be given the brightness that you actually observe. Um, so that's something that came from Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Another thing that came from Sloan Digital Sky Survey that was really important was the uh, SDSS uh, BAO, BAO. So that is Baryon Acoustic Oscillations. Now this might not look like much. Uh, where's the original? This is the original. Now, it might not look like much, but don't be, um, don't be underwhelmed by this. Uh, this is an, a really key result. <clears throat> okay, so what's shown here is basically the, the correlation between galaxies. If you see a galaxy in one spot, what's the probability of seeing another galaxy in another spot separated by some distance? Okay, so this is co-moving separation, so it's basically like how far apart are they today? And if you observe a galaxy in one location, what's the probability of observing another galaxy next to it? So that's what this function tells you. So you can see that it, galaxies tend to cluster, and so it peaks at no separation. That there's, If you see a galaxy in one location, there's actually a fairly high probability of seeing another galaxy that's next door. That's what this says. And that as you get farther and farther apart, the number of galaxies declines. Um, so that's the two-point correlation function. Given a galaxy, what's the probability of seeing another galaxy at some distance in any direction? Uh, but then this is the key that it pokes up right here at about um, around 100 megaparsecs. Well, this is H inverse megaparsecs. And so this is actually about 150 megaparsecs because H is 0.7. Um, H is roughly 0.7. So 1 over 0.7 is uh, some number. Uh, we'll see 100 divided by 0 0.7 should be 130, 140. And this is at about 100. Five, it looks like. So if I go like that, it'll be about 150. So let's go 105 divided by h inverse, which is 0.7, or times h inverse, which is 0.7. So that's 150. So the fact that this is 150 out here, uh, you have to account for the fact that there's h inverse um, in there. So this, uh, I think I did that correctly. So what this separation says is that galaxies tend to be far apart. They you get fewer and fewer and fewer of them the far away, farther away you get from the galaxy that you're considering. But then there is a distance where all of a sudden you see more galaxies. There's an overabundance of galaxies at this separation, and then it drops back down again. So you have basically, a, you, you could imagine a universe where galaxies just decline down until you get to the, you know, the average field. But then you also have this situation where now you have excess galaxies at some distance. Uh, what that's talking about, um, and these are things that are really far apart. So there's no orbits going on here. Uh, 100, 150 megaparsecs, that's like the distance between us. Well, the Andromeda galaxy is like one megaparsec away. So this is 100 times farther away from the Milky Way galaxy than the Andromeda galaxy is. So this is like way out there. Um, what's going on here is that in the early universe, you had sound waves that were bouncing around. Sound waves are bouncing around. You have matter, you know, pressure waves, and matter is spreading out. And the dark matter is also responding to this. So the dark matter is spreading out. Uh, you have regular matter that with sound waves bouncing around. The dark matter is going to start accumulating in the high pressure regions of these sound waves from the very early universe. This is like way early on in the universe where there, nothing has formed yet. But the dark matter is going to start to coalesce in regions where there's an overdensity of regular matter. And that's going to nucleate new galaxies um, at certain distances. So you have one galaxy that forms in one place, and then you have these sound waves that have been propagating the early universe. So where the sound waves compress, you're going to form a galaxy there. And the next place where those galaxies compress, you're going to form a galaxy there as well, or you're more than more likely than not, or because the probability is still fairly low, um, but you're, there's excess probability that you'll, find, you'll form a galaxy in the place where the next sound wave, like the next compression region is in that sound wave. And so this is, the imprint 
of sound waves from the very early universe in the formation of galaxies several billion years later. Um, that's the fingerprint of the sound waves from the early universe is this bump. Okay, and this is actually going to be important in future cosmological measurements. So this is zoomed in. This upper part is zoomed in here on the low, from the lower region. This bump right here is um, that's important because this is a standard separation. You look up in the sky, you see a galaxy in one spot, and then you see excess probability of a galaxy in another spot that's separated by some distance that we know what it is. And so this gives us uh, a quantity called the angular diameter distance. So we saw from the Type 1a supernova results, how dark energy was discovered, the luminosity distance, which is basically how bright does this object appear and what does that tell us about the light spreading out from that object in the past? Did the universe expand and then start to contract again and therefore you know, we get um, the supernova appear brighter when you get a certain distance because of the contraction or maybe the accelerated expansion of the universe? You know, does, it, does it appear brighter because the light's getting concentrated from the universe maybe contracting a little bit? or does it get dimmer faster because the universe is spreading out? So the luminosity distance gives us one way of measuring the history of the universe. But we can do the same kind of measurement now looking at um, different distances, except now looking at the clustering of galaxies at different distances, at different redshifts, and get a different measure of how the universe has expanded and contracted because now we have um, a yardstick. We have a, a the angular diameter distance, which is a a distance across the sky, a ruler basically that's in the sky, and we can map that ruler as a function of distance from us um, and see directly how the universe has expanded. So it's another way of measuring uh, the properties of the universe from this uh, baryon acoustic oscillations. So baryons is like regular matter, acoustic oscillations is sound waves. And this is the result of that 10 billion years later, um, sound waves from the early universe. So that was another big deal discovery from Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Uh, let's see. So we did the supernova survey and we did that one. Okay, now let's take a look. Another thing that you get from a large imaging survey like this is that you'll often see images where the following thing happens. So you take an image, um, you're observing a part of the sky, um, and you're going to observe it multiple times in different pass bands. So you see here's, here's a bunch of dots. And then you would get something that looks like this. Okay, it would be, and it would change colors. So you would see something here that would be like red, and then this would be green, and then this would be blue. And so all of these things just stay there, and then you have these streaks of different colors across the sky. Those are objects that are actually moving in the solar system. And they, you know, you take an image and then you shift the camera. By the time you shift the camera, the object in the solar system has moved some distance because it's orbiting the sun. It's not just out in the, you know, out in the distant, distant cosmos, it's in the solar system, it's orbiting the sun. And so it moves, and so the images don't line up. Um, you can see it drift in a single exposure, because uh, the exposures, I don't remember how long the exposures were, but it's more than, you know, probably like a minute or so, maybe even longer. Uh, you know, Kepler's exposures were 30 minutes. Um, I doubt these were 30 minutes, but they were probably um, many tens of seconds. Uh, but then it, it moves, you shift the camera, you take it in a different filter, and so it looks green now. And then you take it in a different filter, and now it looks red. So these things are objects moving in the solar system. Well, you can trace them out, you can follow their motion across the sky, and you can piece together the orbits of these objects. So these are like um, asteroids that some of them you might know about already, some of them you probably didn't, because this was the, one of the deepest surveys that had been done. And so there was a discovery of thousands of asteroids um, and other objects in the solar system. So there's a video here um that shows so this was a pretty cool video so we're gonna we're gonna watch it and we're gonna watch it on youtube because it's that much awesome of course we're probably gonna get an advertisement of some sort for grammarly so everyone has good grammar okay so this is the asteroids that were discovered through the sloan digital sky survey um and it we know the orbits of these asteroids because we can see them in the, and it only takes a few images um, to piece together their orbits. And they're going to be in a different part of the sky the next year you do the survey. And so you can say, oh, this was this asteroid. Here it is again a year later. And you can piece together what their orbits are based on these observations. Uh, I don't know if the video has a whole lot of sound.
And it's not, I'm actually not feeding it through the sound system, so it's probably not going to sound all that amazing. Anyways, there's no, there's no talking. Um, okay, so some of the things you see, uh, this is obviously a computer animation of the observations that they see. And once you get the orbit, then you just like plug it into the computer and you can run the orbit forward. All right, a few things that we notice. Number one, lots of main belt asteroids. So these are asteroids in the main belt. What's shown, the circles that you're shown here, they're not actually circles, they're ellipses with the sun at one focus of the ellipse. Those are the orbits of the planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, um, out towards the inner edge of the main belt. Then you have the main belt asteroids, and then you have the gap, and then you have Jupiter's orbit out in the outer part. And you can see from Sloan Digital Sky Survey, uh, not only do you see the main belt asteroids, a lot of main belt asteroids, um, we'll see how many they discovered when we go back to the main page. Uh, and then you also see a bunch of Trojans. So these things up here and these things down here, those are the Trojan asteroids relative to Jupiter. So Jupiter will be located right there. These are objects that are trapped in this location of Jupiter's orbit because of the mutual gravitational influence of the Sun, Jupiter, plus Jupiter's rotation. So together, the Sun, Jupiter, and Jupiter's rotation combine to make it a stable location to place something. So you can put an asteroid there and it will stay there, uh, stable. Another thing you can see from this that's is this little group of asteroids right here that seems to be like a fuzzy tail that sticks out from the main belt right here. It's actually, these are called the Hildas. Um, and so there's a group right here, there's a group over here by the Trojans on this side and a group over here by the Trojans on this side. So the Hilda asteroids, we'll see what their orbits look like as the animation continues. But these are objects, they have kind of plunging orbits um, and they come out to this part of their orbit when Jupiter is opposite them. So these are uh, orbits of asteroids that are in a three to two uh, mean motion resonance with Jupiter. So they, their orbits are shaped such that they always avoid Jupiter as they go around. And they orbit three times every time Jupiter orbits twice. Those are the Hilda asteroids. And then you can see some Earth crossing asteroids. You can see some asteroids that are from the inner edge kind of creeping into the inner part of the solar system. Those are useful to see. You know, it's good to know what kind of asteroids might destroy us in the future um, to identify them so that we can at least know what killed us when the time comes. So it is pretty cool to see all these asteroids coming in. A lot of these asteroids, you know, you wouldn't detect them until much later because they don't necessarily process all the images in real time. Uh, another thing that's interesting to see here is how thick the asteroid belt is. Um, this is probably exaggerated um, a, a decent amount, but yeah, you know what? I doubt it. Okay, this is probably like to scale. The asteroid belt is fairly fluffy. It doesn't take much to excite asteroids into high inclination orbits. So this probably is um, to scale in terms of how much the asteroid belt flares. All right, let's see if we can skip ahead a little bit. So most of these asteroids are going to be fairly small. I don't know what the limitation would be in terms of what you can detect. Uh, some of them, it probably depends on what they're made out of, because some asteroids are darker than others, like they don't reflect as much light as others, and so they're harder to find, even though they might be bigger. The typical one here is probably like 100 meters across, something like that. Okay, so if you look here, you'll see these Hildas that are kind of moving slowly. They're going to move on uh, eccentric orbits like this. So you'll see them come out and then they'll go in again at fairly um, steep trajectories towards the center. Uh, how long in advance do we know to be safe from cataclysmic asteroid impacts? Well, we want to know as far enough in advance as possible. Like, you can really only predict the future of the solar system out to like 100 million years or so because there is some chaos in the solar system, and so we don't necessarily know what the behavior of Mercury is going to be, and that can disrupt uh, planets. Um, so, uh, you know, but if we have, if we have a thousand years worth of notice, then that's plenty to do something about it. Um, okay. Other science results. Let's see. I think that basically runs us to the end of this. So SDSS has gone through several iterations. I don't know what current iteration they're on, but it was certainly groundbreaking in a number of ways. Not only the cosmology. Oh, that was the other thing I was going to show is the, um, the SDSS Galaxy Power Spectrum, Spectrum, Spectrum. This is one of the things that they set out to do was measure the galaxy power spectrum. There we go. OK, 
Okay, so the reason that they want to measure the galaxy power spectrum, um, SCSS galaxies here in black, and they get the peak. The peak of the power spectrum basically tells you a lot about the composition of the universe. Um, the, you know, this shows you the H inverse megaparsecs. It peaks at 100, what, 100, that's 200, 300, like 300 H inverse megaparsecs. Um, this basically tells you uh, how are galaxies distributed across the sky? What's the most common separation between galaxies uh, in the universe? And um, that is useful for getting the ratio of regular matter to dark matter and dark energy. Well, uh, uh, not I lied. It gives you the ratio of matter to dark energy, uh, dark matter to dark energy mostly because regular matter doesn't really contribute that much. Um, but total matter to total dark energy to total energy density of the universe, the composition of the universe basically, is constrained by the properties of this power spectrum. Like, where is the peak? What's the most common separation between galaxies? So that is um, another thing that came out of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey that was important. So there we go. That is the Sloan Digital Sky Survey in all of its power and glory.